let us start. We are happy to have Ashok Sen with his last lecture about Dean Stantons in string theory. So let me remind you that in the last lecture we had introduced this open string propagator and also how to deal with this. And the idea was that this was the expression that we would have gotten from the world sheet picture okay. and this is the string field theory picture and in the string field theory picture okay, we can uh, uh, resolve the divergences for the negative L0 states and for L0 equal to 0 states we can uh, uh, I mean somehow ins use insights from quantum field theory to deal with these corresponding divergences and for positive L0 of course both are fi uh, uh, finite so you can use either the string field theory or the white sheet picture. Okay. So this is for the open strings now we also have closed strings so in the current problem we also have closed. problem we have open and closed strings and if you recall the discussion in the first lecture okay, the external states are only closed strings. But the internal states can be open or closed. So this means that we need closed string propagator also. And it has a structure very similar to this. It is proportional to L0 plus L0 bar inverse, okay, where these are the holomorphic and anti holomorphic Virazor generators, and this we can also express as integral 0 to infinity dt. And again the world sheet picture gives you this and the string field theory picture directly gives you this and this is the connection between the two pictures. Okay. So in principle we can deal with the divergences associated with closed strings okay, also in the same way. Okay. Uh, but there is certain simplification for closed strings at least for the current problem okay. that if you look at the L0 plus L0 of our eigenvalues. they have the form k square plus m square okay, where k is the momentum carried by the closed strings up to a proportionality constant. Okay. So the difference is that the closed strings actually carry momentum which open strings did not okay. and because closed strings carry momentum okay, we can adjust k so we can analytically continue k. to make k square plus m square positive. Okay. At least for at low order this is always possible, low, uh, the order at which you will be working this is always possible okay. and which means that you do not really need the power of string field theory to deal with closed string divergences you can just do it by analytic continuation because by analytic continuation you can make this integral convergent because once this is positive then of course this integral is convergent and the world sheet has no problem. So you do not need string field theory at least at low order okay. 
an equivalent way of saying this is that we can integrate out, can integrate out the closed strings. So in the language of string field theory, this will mean that any contribution to diagrams that has a closed string propagator, we can redefine into the definition of the vortices, interaction vortices. Okay, so just closed strings that don't will not appear in the propagator. So this means that effectively that we have external states as closed strings will be closed strings. and internal states will be open strings. Okay. And we will the, use the notation where closed strings will be denoted by uh, wavy line and open strings will be denoted by straight line. Okay. So we will see that in all the diagrams that we will be drawing, these will be the external states and these will be the internal. So now let us recall the discussion that we had on the first lecture. Okay. So leading order the only divergent contribution was the annulus uh, partition function right that we uh, dealt with. Okay. So at for sub leading order. So we had several uh, divergent contributions. So first, so you always have e to the minus c over g s. So let me write down the whole expression. Then exponential of annulus, and then we had a disk two-point function and product of disk one-point functions. Okay, so n minus one of these sorry n minus 2 of these and 1 of these. Okay, this is on subletting because compared to the case where you have altogether n disks with one closed string vertex of partner each, this has an order gs. Yes. yes. Uh, will there be some combinatorial factor like n minus 2 uh, because uh, this uh, uh, you know. Yeah, we will write down the combinatorial factor in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Right? So, I will write down the expression for these diagrams. I think then it will become clear. I see. Thank you. Then you have e to the minus c over g s exponential of this and then sorry I should separate out the diagrams so there is a confusion. So this is the first diagram. The second one will be annulus one point function and then this one point functions. Okay, so we will have n minus one of these and one of these. And then there are two, di two diagrams that I will draw together. Then you have the product of these quant point functions as n these quant point functions, n of these. And then we can have a disk with two holes okay, or a torus with one hole. These two I am drawing together, we will just take the sum of these. Because both of these have Euler number of minus 1. Okay, so this is the leading contribution and these will give extra factors of Gs because of this Euler number minus 1. Okay, so these are all of the same order. So to write a convenient expression for this, we will introduce two or three quantities Gs times F omega 1, omega 2 will be by definition 
the disk 2 point function divided by the product of disk 1 point two disk 1 point functions. And omega and omega 2 are just the energies. Are the energies. Okay, so let me label. So this is one and two here, and this is one and this is two. So that's the definition of GS times F. GS factors are taken out because this goes as one over GS, whereas this goes as one over GS square. So the net uh, ratio is of order GS. Okay. Then GS times G omega will be annulus one point function divided by this one point. And then I will define G s times C as just the sum of these two. And the point is that all of these are divergent. F, G, C are all divergent. So, let me write the expressions for divergent part. So, f we will write as f finite plus f divergent and g also will write as g finite plus g divergent and c will not split, c is also divergent. This is perhaps a slightly tangential question, uh, but uh, is there an unambiguous answer for f finite or g finite or uh, is it uh, somewhat scheme dependent as in uh, quantum field theory? No, we will first, uh, I mean once you define what f divergent is, then this is finite, this is unambiguous. Hmm. Because you will just subtract of the divergent integral hmm. and then declare the rest as finite. I see. But uh, th that, uh, uh, what we define as a divergent quantity is typically scheme dependent. Well, that is after we do the integral. We will separate out. So, the point is this will be an integral. F is an integral mm -hmm. with a diver with an integrand which diverges at some certain ends, right. Mm. We will take a particular quantity and subtract it so that the integral is finite. Mm. Then that becomes unambiguous, right. Yes. We have just defined yeah. it that way. Yeah. Then all the ambiguity comes in defining the divergent part. Yeah. Yeah. And we will see. So, the whole purpose of today's lecture is to see how to extract the divergent part, right. We will try to make the divergent part into unambiguous finite pieces. I see. So, that will be the main goal. Thank you. Oh, what, I, what is the difference between the two diagrams I was... Between, between the two? Between the two diagrams that you drew? This oh, this, this is a disk with two holes. Okay. okay. This is a torus with one hole, right. So, this is, this is not a hole. This is a, a donut. Think of a donut and cut out a hole in that, right. But as this is like having a disk with two holes. But both have order number minus one, that's why I have put them together. Okay. But this is, a, uh, nobody has calculated this so far. Okay. So, will not, this will not be of um, uh, too much uh, uh, importance today at least. Okay. So, the divergent parts, I write them as integrals. is half this integral in fact we had seen before okay, I had just given it as an example okay so basically what happens is that f is an integral and once you subtract of this part from the integrand okay, then the rest of the integral is finite so f finite that way is unambiguously defined Okay, because you have the subtractor of the divergent pieces. Okay. And let me write this as a f plus b 
df omega 1 omega 2. Okay, where a f and b f are both divergent integrals. Okay, and our goal will be to figure out what a f and b f are. Okay. Similarly, g, the divergent part of g is this is a double integral. Again, this is something we have seen before. So, these are this is divergent integral from v equal to 0 and x equal to 0 n. This is divergent from the v equal to 0 n. So, again we will write this as a g plus b g omega square. Okay, where these again we do not know, these are all both divergent integrals. So, let me write the amplitude in terms of these quantities. Okay, and I think here the combinatorial factor will also become clear. So, let me call it A1. A1 because this is the first subleading order. One stands because it is for subleading order. So, if we look at these definitions, okay, this, so you are trying to sum up, sum these, and if you look at these definitions, okay, you can easily convince yourself that this has the following structure is G s times the leading order contribution leading order result is basically a product of disks with this exponential of minus C by G s and exponential of the annulus partition function times So, this comes from these diagrams okay. and the point is that these two could be any or any pair out of the n, right. That is why you have those sums and similarly here this could be any of those n's, right. That is why you have that sum. And now if we use this fact that f we write as a finite plus f divergent and f divergent and g divergent has this kind of structure, okay. we can write this, this quantity as finite contribution plus n into n minus 1 by 2 a f This is fine, right? The finite includes the f finite and g finite contributions, which I am not worried about. Okay. There are these many f's because of this. Okay, each pair gives an f. N edges, as you can see, 
right? C is only once. And then we have this energy dependent contribution. So Bg times sum over omega I square and Af times sum over omega G omega. But this quantity, after I use the energy conservation, so the energy conservation will come at the end, right? We have seen the integral over the y will give energy conservation. So this leading order result has its delta function. So once you use this, okay, these two can be combined into one term which is Bg minus half Af Ag, sorry, minus half Bf. Is this clear? Right? I just use the sum over omega j equal to 0 to convert this into sum over omega j square. Yes. So the point is you <laughs> include the j equal to k term. Right? In that case, you can okay, you put a half and they just do free sum over j and k, that, for that, that term vanishes, right? And the extra term that you are including is the j equal to k term that you have to subtract off. That's how you get this. Sorry, this is Bf. Af has already gone there. Okay, so now let me describe the strategy. So the, our goal will be to then calculate these numbers, right? AF and JAG and BF and BG. Okay, as I said, C will not calculate. Okay. But fortunately, because we have N dependence here, so the way this comparison goes with the matrix model is the matrix model result gives a result for all N. So, once you know the result for all n, you can just take appropriate linear combinations to uh, 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 eliminate C. So by comparison the matrix, for comparison of the matrix model, we can actually figure out what AF, AG and this combination is. And the important point that will become, the significance will become clear later is that this combination is what appears in the expression for the S matrix element, this BG minus half PF. So here is a strategy. First, we want to express the amplitude as sum over Feynman diagrams. Once you do that, then L0 less than 0 contributions automatically become finite. Right? Because you will get them as 1 over L0 instead of the integral. But there will be divergent contributions from the L0 equal to 0 states, okay, because 1 over L0 is infinity. But we have seen how to deal with these L0 equal to 0 states. There are the origin of the L0 equal to 0 states. First, there is a bosonic 0 mode, which is a translation mode. Okay. That mode, we saw that you are instructed to integrate at the very end, the integral over y. Right. So the path integral should not include that. Right? The path integral which leads to the Feynman rules, okay, that should uh, not include the y integral because y integral has to be done separately at the very end. Okay. So we remove the L0 equal to 0 contribution from the propagator. Okay. 
So the L0 equal zero contributions will come from the translation modes and also the two host modes which are there, which are there in the single gauge, right? And the uh, string perturbation theory gives in the result in the single gauge. But you saw that those modes also should be removed because those are not physical, right? We are uh, treating the integrals differently by look integrating over the gauge invariant variables and dividing by the volume of the gauge group. So all the L0 equals 0 modes will have to be subtracted from the propagator. So that gets rid of all the divergences because the divergences came from L0 less than 0 and L0 equal to 0 modes. But this, this is not the end of it. So you have to add back the phi contribution, add the contribution from phi in the propagator. Phi, if you recall, was the out of single gauge mode. Right, the C0 equal on the vacuum mode. Okay, this is not inclu included in the wall sheet expressions because the wall sheet gives the result in the single gauge. So this has to be explicitly added into the propagator now. And finally, okay, this is something that I'll try to explain later. Okay, but let me write this anyway. Okay. We have to account for change in the Jacobian or corrections to the Jacobian from psi b naught to y and theta to alpha change of variables. Namely, we had seen, for example, that we had psi b0 equal to k1y, right? And we had calculated k1. Okay. But this is going to get corrected at higher order. And because of these corrections, okay. the Jacobian of change of variable from psi b to y will have additional terms. Okay, and those additional terms will also contribute to the amplitudes, and they have to be taken into account because they are not accounted for in the Walsh formalism. And the same thing is for theta to alpha k2 times alpha. This all also get corrected. Okay, so let me try to describe the analysis of the f. Okay, and then I'll just write the result for g. Okay, once you do the analysis for f, it will become at least part of the procedure will become clear. So if this was a disk two point function, okay. but it's it will be more convenient to represent this as a two point function on the upper half plane. Okay. We have a map from the disk to upper half plane. Okay, for example, u equal to one plus i z over one minus i z. So if this is a disk coordinate, unit disk, this is the upper half plane coordinate. Okay, you can easily convince yourself that this as z takes value on the upper half plane, u takes value on the disk, unit disk. Okay, so there is a map from disk to upper half plane. So, we will work in the upper half plane. Okay. So, in the upper half plane, okay. there is an SL2 invariance. So, we can fix three quantities. Okay. So, we will fix one of the closed string vertex of partner at the point i 
okay i you can see from this that that corresponds to u equal to 0 right that is like placing the vertex operator one of the vertex operator at the center okay. and the other one i'll place at i times y okay and then let y vary from 0 to 1 that's the independent if y goes out of this range, you can do a z to minus 1 over z transformation to bring it back in this range. So, the reason that I have parameterized this by y okay. is because this is a variable y that appears in the expression for f. Okay. So, this integral of course came from the y sheet okay. and the y that you see here okay. is exactly that y. Okay, that I have introduced. Okay. And so you see the divergence as y goes to 0 here okay. corresponds to the divergence when this goes to the boundary. Okay, that is the, that's the source of the divergence and that is that's what you have to deal with. So, let me draw the Feynman diagrams. Okay, and again, I have integrated out the closed string, so there will be no closed string propagator, internal propagator. Okay. So, two Feynman diagrams that you have to deal with. This I will call diagram A, and the other one, this is a vortex. is I call diagram B. So, this is like a contactor, no internal propagator, this is with one open string internal propagator. Okay, and we will see that this is the one which is going to be responsible for, like that, for divergence because this has the 1 over L0, right, the, where, where the divergences will come from. So, this two-point vortex okay. roughly is the two point function of one closed string and one open string. Okay, so, in the upper half plane we can think of this as a two point function of one closed string and one open string. Okay, because this is one closed one open. And by SL2 invariance we can always choose the closed string at i and open string at 0. Okay, because now there are only few things to fix, we can fix all of them. Is unlike in the case of two closed strings where there are four things, four variables and so we could fix three of them, but one of them had to be <coughs> integrated. But to calculate this Feynman diagram, we need more. Okay. And we need more because we see that the, you need off shell, there are off shell states, right? This internal propagator is off shell. Okay. So, just by saying that we have vortex operator insertions at i and 0, does not specify the amplitude fully. Okay, we have to specify a little more okay. and I will now explain what extra ingredient that you have to we need for calculating this Feynman diagram. for calculating off shell amplitude, off shell interaction vortex. Okay, so, the interaction vortex is external states on shell, off shell.
So local coordinate basically is some arbitrary complex coordinate system. You can, it's up to you to fix. Okay. But you have to say what coordinate system we are going to use around, sorry, around, around this point and what coordinate system we are going to use around this point. Okay. Because in, you have to insert the vertex property in that coordinate system. Okay. And that makes a difference if the vertex operators are off-shell, okay, because if the dimension 0 primaries, then it does not matter. Okay. So, for on-shell vertex operators, which are dimension 0 primaries, it does not matter what coordinate system you use, right, because they are uh, 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 conformally invariant. Okay. But for uh, um, operators which are not dimension 0 primaries, right, which is typically the case for uh, generic off-shell states, we have to specify which coordinate system you are using, you are uh, uh, inserting the vertex operator. So, that is the meaning of local coordinate. So, Z is the global coordinate, Z the UHP coordinate. And typically around the puncture, J will be a function of W, some function that you have to specify. Okay. And in general, this function can be different around different vertex operators. Okay. Around the one vertex operator, you choose one W, another vertex operator, you choose another W. Once you have chosen this local coordinate, okay, and you have found the functional relationship between Z and W, then the vertex operator is inserted, operator is inserted as where f this notation is basically the conformal transform of v of v under f. Okay. So, in other words, okay. you do not insert a vertex operator directly in the z coordinate system, you specify some local coordinate inside a vertex operator in the local coordinate system. But your correlation function, final correlation function is being calculated in the Z coordinate system, right? Z is the global coordinate on the upper half plane. So, you have to convert from the W to Z, okay? And this F dot V basically does that. That V is inserted in the W coordinate system, but this tells you what it becomes in the Z coordinate system. Okay. So, I will write down some examples of what we mean by F dot V. f dot c for example, this is the ghost field. c we know has dimension minus 1, right? it is a primary, but it has dimension minus 1. So, this is f prime of w inverse on c of f of w. Right? We can write down explicitly what this is and the f of w of course is z. Right. So, if you are trying to calculate the correlation function of a C, if one of the off-shell states was C, then this is the vertex of what, this is what you insert in the correlation function. If we take F of the derivative of C, right, this is not a primary. So, you have to do more work, but this is the W derivative of F prime W inverse times c of f of w, okay, and you can work it out by chain rule. Okay, so, in principle, this is not simple, but you can always work it out what this f dot uh, given operator is. Okay. So, the idea is that if we take, for example, this vortex, right, what Suppose we are trying to calculate this two-point vortex. This is C, this is O. This is a disk two-point function. Okay. So, this will be given by our upper half plane two-point function. This will be given by some F C of 
let me call it W and A4 or W prime, A4 or W on upper half plane. Okay, we have to choose these functions Fc and A4. It's completely up to us to choose. Okay. And then the two point function, the, this offshell two point function will be given by this. Is this clear? So now you can ask that, I mean, if there is so much choice in this choice in the, how you choose Fc and Fo, okay. that looks like that the offshell amplitudes are completely up to us to define. Right? It's not a unique object, and indeed, it's not a unique object. Okay. So different choices of these functions okay, give rise to different, apparently different strength field theories. But what one can show is that these different choices that gives rise to apparent different string field theories are all related by Fili definition. That you take string field theory constructed with one particular set of choices of this and string field theory constructed with another case of set of choices of these functions. Okay. There is a change of fields, okay, a redefinition of fields that takes you from the first string field theory to the second string field theory. So all physical results at the end should be independent of how you choose this. Okay, even though the intermediate steps will depend on how you choose this. Is it clear? Maybe if I, for I do some explicit calculation, it will become a little clearer. Sorry. Yes. Uh, then can't you just choose W equal to Z? as a gauge uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, you can. about this? Yeah, you can. But there is a better gauge than that otherwise. There is a? Is there a better gauge? Because otherwise we wouldn't have discussed this. No, you just say W equal Z and... Uh, well, we will choose almost W equal to Z. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, final results shouldn't depend on whether you choose W equal to Z or not. No, no, okay. Yeah. yeah. But you can certainly choose W equal to Z. Okay, thanks. Okay. The other point to note is that in this diagram, we are interested in, so our goal is to compute this diagram, right? This, in this diagram, the external states are closed strings, these are all on shell. Right? Closed strings are not internal propagators, so external closed strings are on shell. So we do not really need a choice of this. Okay. So because this is on shell, We do not need this. Whatever you take this to be, right, it is uh, invariant. Okay, so it, the result does not depend on what choice of Fc you have made. So we really only want this. We have to make a choice of F. Okay. And we will choose. for open string vortex operator W equal to Z by lambda. Z by lambda, yeah. Sorry, lambda Z. Okay. Well, lambda is an arbitrary constant. And if what I have told you is true, then the final results better be independent of lambda, right? Because it's a choice that you are making. And so it's always a good idea to use some parameters so that at the end you can check that the result is independent of that parameter to make sure that you have not done something wrong. Okay, so this lambda will serve that purpose for us. So with this, then f dot v, f dot some v open of w, okay. if this is primary of dimension, okay, you don't need primary because this is just simple scaling. 
So this will be, let me just make sure that I have the factor set, it's lambda to the minus h v, let me just write v times v of x w. So now with this, we can now try to calculate this diagram, right, for that diagram. So let me go back here. So there is one straightforward way of doing it, which is that you take closed string vortex operators are fixed. So you take every possible open string state, calculate this two-point function using this formula, right, because the closed string is inserted at i and the open string is inserted at 0, but with the scaling, right, so that you will figure out factor, factor of lambda to the minus h for every open string state. So you calculate this, you calculate this, take the product, multiply by 1 over L0 and sum, right, that is one way of doing it. However, the word identities of conformal field theory gives you another way of doing it, right, and I will tell you what the result of that. Uh, uh, what identity analysis is. So for this, let us write this 1 over L0 as integral 0 to infinity dt e to the minus t times L0. Okay. And what I am going to give you is to say what happens for every t, right. You have replaced the propagator by this. So what you insert here? is not 1 over L0, but e to the minus T L0, right? the T integral will be done at the end, okay? And I will give you an algorithm to calculate this. So CFT word identities tell us the following. So we take two copies of the upper half plane. Why two copies? Because one, we have one upper half plane coming from here, one upper half plane coming from here. Okay, so two copies of upper half plane. Let's call this the Z and Z prime as the two upper half plane. And so correspondingly, we have a local coordinates W. So W is will be equal to lambda Z, and here you have W prime equal to lambda z prime. Okay, these are the two diagrams corresponding to these two vortices. So each, so this has a closed string vortex operator 1 inserted here and this has 2 inserted here. Okay, and the open string vortex operator is inserted here and they are being, uh, and you have this matrix element of e to the minus tl0. So what the CFT identities tell us is after you sum over all intermediate states, that corresponds to identifying W and W prime via W W prime equal to minus Q, where Q is equal to e to the minus T. So CFT identities tell us that this diagram after you sum over all intermediate states, but the propagator replaced by e to the minus t L0 okay, is equivalent to calculating a correlation function on a Riemann surface where you identify W and W prime by this identification. Now, since W and Z have this simple relation, this can also be translated as lambda square Z Z prime as minus Q or Z prime equal to minus q over lambda square z.
So, this is now a single upper half plane. Parameterized by the coordinate z, we can also use z prime, it does not matter, ok. Take coordinate z and z prime is given in terms of z. So, z prime is not a new coordinate anymore. Okay. So, now look, look at the vortex of orders of upper positions. So, 1 is at z equal to i and if you are using the z coordinate system, it remains at z equal to i. 2 was at z prime equal to i, but that corresponds to, well, let me write a z as minus q square over lambda minus q over lambda square z prime. So, this z prime is i that corresponds to z equal to i q over lambda square. So, this means in the upper half plane, we have one vortex apart at i and the vortex apart at i times q by lambda square. Okay. And if you recall, this is what we had called y. So, we conclude that y has to be identified as q over lambda square, which is e to the minus t over lambda square. Is this clear? Yes. So, we were free to pick lambda as we like. So, yes. how do you guarantee that q over lambda squared is necessarily between 0 and 1 if we are well, you cannot, ok. I mean, you, you are free to choose lambda, lambda as you like, but you should not choose it so that things are singular. Right. Right. Uh, but, uh, ok, you can choose it in your, any way you like, right. Let me complete this and it will become clear, right, what the rest of the uh, uh, integration region is, right. But it is just that you have two singularities which have to be subtracted off, right. So, it is better to choose lambda sufficiently large so that you, that does not happen. Right, ok. Yeah, so that is, otherwise it will be like a singular field definition. Mm -hmm. Right, that uh, the theories are still equivalent, but under a singular field definition. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this means that as t goes from zero to infinity, y goes from zero to one over lambda square. So this basically says that this diagram A that we see, okay, this covers the region. I had told you that the way string field theory gives rise to the uh, 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 usual wall sheet amplitudes is that each diagram covers part of the integration region. Okay. And by this correspondence, we see that this diagram A corresponds to the integration region 0 less than y less than 1 over lambda square. Okay. And hence, the rest of the region has to be covered by the diagram B. So, this must cover 1 over lambda square less than y less than 1. Okay. So, this will be the definition of the di of the uh, of this vortex, okay. because this is the sense in which I said that the string filter is designed so that it reproduces a wall sheet amplitude. Okay. So, the general procedure is that you calculate all Feynman diagrams and you see how much of the moduli space you have gotten and whatever you have not got, you declare as a new contact diagram and you do it at every stage. Okay. And here you see that if you had taken this lambda in the wrong way, right, so that y extends beyond uh, 1, you basically have to subtract of that. So, this will have a negative contribution, right, which you have to subtract of. So, that should be the definition of this vortex. But it is easier to take lambda to be sufficiently large so that that does not happen. Okay, so now we are in a position to do the analysis. So, let us take the original integral, right. Let me, I will explain how this is done. So, you have this divergent part half 
integral dy y to the minus 2 1 plus 2 omega 1 omega 2 y. This I am not going to split into two parts integral 0 to 1 over lambda square dy y is to the minus 2. So, second integral is of course easy, this will be half. So, this gives you half times 1 over lambda square minus 1 plus 2 omega 1 omega 2 log lambda square. Okay, this is an ordinary integral. So, no problem with this, right. This is the divergent part is here. You can see the y, goal, y equal to 0 region is here. So, here you have to change variable from y to t. So, here you change variable from y to t and that relation was y, yeah, y is equal to the minus t over lambda square. So, if you make this change of variables, you find that this is half integral 0 to infinity dt lambda square e to the t plus 2 omega 1 omega 2 Now, you can see that this is e to the power h with h equal to minus 1. So, this corresponds to L 0 equal to minus 1 state, okay, because it is like e to the t a minus t L 0 that is what you are comparing with, right. So, this corresponds to L 0 equal to minus 1 state, okay. So, you should replace this by half lambda square times 1 over minus 1, 1 over L 0, right, that is this contribution. This one is L0 equal to 0 state. Okay. But L0 equal to 0 states you are supposed to remove, right. If this contribution means that this, this is a contribution of L0 equal to 0 state in the propagator, but you are supposed to remove them. So, just drop this. So, you can add this to this, right, the 1 over 2 lambda square just cancels between this minus half lambda square and here. So, total is minus half plus omega 1 omega 2 log lambda square. This is the result that you get from this Feynman diagram. Other questions? Now, we are not done yet. We have to do one more thing, which is that in this diagram, okay, now you have to take the contribution of the phi propagator, right? Because you said you have to remove the zero modes, right? but you have to add back the contribution from the phi propagator. Right, which is not there in the original worksheet expression. 
So you have to calculate a diagram like this. Now, if you recall, the action had phi square plus other things, okay, and phi is a real field. So, from this, it follows that the phi propagated is half. Okay, if it has half phi square, it would have been one. Right? That's the, the for real fields that. That's the standard convention, right? Because it's phi square, it's phi propagated is half. And then you have to calculate these two point functions, right? But you know how to calculate this, right? The two point function, so this vortex. So we basically have this half of this times, so this is one times this two. Okay. So this is half of a upper up plane two point function of the closed string vortex of part i okay. and f dot phi if you recall the phi was the state it was multiplying c0 on the vacuum which is so the phi vortex of part is the derivative of c This is the first vortex operator, the second vortex operator. Okay. But since this has conformal at 0, okay, this is the same as this. Okay. And you can show that this correlation function actually is 0. Okay, that is by some symmetry of the coarse correlation function. Because in this particular example, the phi exchange just vanishes. Okay, but this is not generally true. I mean, generally, you will get contribution from phi exchange. In fact, even if you had taken a different look coordinate system, in instead of this, if you had taken w equal to lambda z over 1 plus a z, for example, right, then this will no longer vanish. This will no longer vanish, but uh, this will also be different. This analysis will also be different. Right? At the end, this dependence on A just cancels out. Anyway, so because it's 0, this is the total F. get f divergent omega 1 omega 2 is minus half and now if you use the fact we have, we have defined this as a f plus b f omega 1 omega 2 we see that AF is minus half and BF is log lambda square. Are there questions? Yes. I may be losing my mind, but it looks like the first integral over here has a lambda squared and the second one has a 1 over lambda squared. And I'm, I don't see why they cancel and you only get this log lambda squared term. Oh, I think I made a mistake somewhere. This is actually lambda squared. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Because it's dy over y squared, right? So it's 1 over y and the lower limit is 1 over lambda squared. Okay, now I will not have time to describe the full calculation of G, okay, but let me just say, so G, 
divergent gets contribution from for the Feynman diagrams ok that analysis basically is the same as what I described except that it is slightly more complicated because there are more diagrams and more uh, complicated diagrams ok and then the phi exchange ok once you have identified the Feynman diagrams then every open string propagator you can possibly replace by phi right so that you have to calculate separately but the calculation is exactly this that you have to calculate the phi, phi propagator is half and then you have to calculate the appropriate vortices and put them together. But there are two more contributions that come from this Jacobian and that is the last thing I am going to say. So, recall that we had this relation psi b naught equal to q 1 y and this was based on the study of how the psi b couples to a bunch of closed rings right y of course always couples as it to i omega y so that there is no confusion but psi b naught how psi b naught come couples to a bunch of closed rings and the point is that once you have some additional closed string background that changes how psi b naught couples changes and as a result the relationship between psi b naught and y also changes gets modified at higher order ok. So, typically at the next order it takes the following form ok. So, this f is some known function and this c of om c omega is the massless closed string field the Fourier component of the massless closed string field. So, basically this says that when you write the make a change of variable from psi to y you get a Jacobian that gets an additional factor of 1 plus g s integral d omega omega f omega <coughs> which you can exponentiate and write an exponential of g s to this order okay. So, it is as if you have gotten an additional term in the action okay, which is linear in C. C is the closed string field and if you have an additional term that is linear in C then you get an additional one point function additional contribution to the one point function ok. So, besides the annulus diagram that we studied this is an additional this will give an additional contribution to the one point function that is not captured by the world sheet Feynman diagrams right? because world sheet does not know about the fact that you are making change of variable from psi b to y to carry out the integration over y okay. and a similar effect exists. for theta equal to k 2 alpha ok. Here again there are corrections okay, of a similar kind. So, these Jacobians have to be taken into account ok and at the end of it. So, you have to sum over all of this. So, the Feynman diagram phi exchange then the one point function of c that you will get from this Jacobian and the one point function of c that you will get from this Jacobian. So, after you add all that plus the Jacobians I write the result for g here. So, we get g divergent of omega as half omega.
omega square log lambda square by 4. But this is supposed to be equal to ag plus bg omega square. Okay, so by comparing this, we see that ag is 0 and bg is half omega square, sorry, half log lambda square by 4. Okay. So, at the end of all this, you have AF, BF, AG and BG. C, as I said, has not been calculated, okay, because that is a more complicated calculation. Now, you see that AF and AG are independent of lambda, okay, which is yeah, what it should be. Right? They appear in the S formula for the S matrix. BG and BF are not independent of lambda. But if you recall the S matrix involved not BG and BF separately, but only in a particular combination. Let me, that was, we had a BG minus BF by 2. Right? This was what is multiplying omega square, sum over omega j square. And you can easily convince yourself that if you take this combination, right, this half log lambda square gets cancelled and you get this combination as minus half log 4, which is lambda independent. So, this lambda independence on the final answer is a consistency check that you are doing things correctly. Okay, and in fact, you can introduce many more parameters because every time you have a new vortex, right, you have a lot of freedom of choosing the local coordinates. So, you can try to introduce as many parameters as you like and make sure that at the end everything cancels, right, because that is a check. So, there is a balance that if the more parameters you introduce, the more complicated the calculation is, right, but the uh, advantage is that then you can at the end you can check if the things all cancel, the extra dependence. Okay. And these results actually agree with the matrix model. The matrix model results are evaluated numerically, okay. So, the comparison is numerical, but it is uh, uh, quite a good accuracy. This minus half log 4, 0 and the half or minus half, right, they agree with what you get from the matrix model calculation, which is a dual calculation. Okay. So, I think I will stop here. I think this is at a time. Thank you. So, you may, there also this third uh, contribution, which you mentioned it has not been covered. Which contribution? I mean, this uh, torus. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, that um, has not been calculated. I mean, matrix model gives I, an answer. I mean, it in fact says that this should be 0, the sum of the two, but that has not been calculated. But is there some essential difficulty, or is it just like. No, it is like a genus 2 calculation, right? I mean, it is a square root of a genus 2 calculation. So, that is the difficulty. But uh, I do not think there is any essential uh, uh, okay. difficulty in that. So, we can leave it as a homework for yeah. students here. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, and maybe another thing I should have said that I listed those seven cases where the annulus partition function has been checked, right. This has been checked only in two and a half examples. So, there is a lot to do here. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Ashok for the great set of lectures. <laughs> <laughs>